Well, welcome everyone. Um, my name is uh, Alberto Rossi, I'm an Associate Professor of Finance at Georgetown. I'm also the Associate Director for the Center for Financial Markets and Policy. And uh, welcome uh, to this uh, great event uh, titled The New Gold Rush, a discussion on the institutionalization of digital assets. I'm super excited about this event because uh, it's really kind of uh, all uh, the, the, the product of the effort of Chris. So Chris Maturi is uh, the FinTech Fellow at the Center and he spent the fall working on uh, a, I think, fantastic paper on the uh, adoption of digital assets by institutional asset managers. And throughout his work, he reached out to many experts uh, to kind of uh, fill in the blanks. And some of these experts are here with us today. So um, I don't wanna spend too much time uh, uh, taking away from, from this event, but I would like to thank all the panelists and Chris Maturi for the, the great effort. And uh, I wish everyone a great day and a good continuation of the event. And I think we can kick it to Caleb. Feel free to unmute yourself and introduce the speaker. Oh, Chris, do you want to take over? Oh, I think Caleb is saying that he's not allowed to unmute. Oh, sorry uh, about that. Okay, thank you. All right. uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Caleb Sarawar. I'm a junior at MSB studying accounting and finance. Uh, I just want to say thank you for Chris for inviting me to contribute to this incredible piece of research. Uh, today, I'm fortunate enough to introduce a few individuals who have graciously taken time out of their busy schedules to speak with us. First, we have uh, Mr. Tim McCourt, who is a seasoned professional in the financial services industry with more than 20 years of experience. In his current role, he serves as CME Group's Managing Director and Global Head of Equity Products and Alternative Investments. Before the CME, Mr. McCourt spent time on the Delta One desk at RBS and in the Equity Derivatives Group at J.P. Morgan. Next, we have Mr. Michael Morrow. He is an alumnus of our very own Georgetown McDonald School of Business. After graduating in 2000, Mr. Morrow has gone on to hold many roles in the financial services industry. He currently serves as CEO of Genesis Trading. Under his leadership, the firm has grown to more than 70 billion in annual trades, loans, and transactions. <clears throat> Mr. James Katolis is the founder and CEO of Typhoon Capital Management. At Typhoon, he oversees the execution of a variety of trading strategies, including the Leonidas Cryptocurrency Fund. Mr. Katolis has made appearances on CNBC and Bloomberg, as well as in print publications such as the Wall Street Journal, Forbes, and Reuters. Finally, Mr. Jack McDonald holds the illustrious title of Double Hoya. Mr. McDonald graduated from the School of Foreign Service in 1988 and Georgetown Law Center in 1993. After his time on the Hilltop, Mr. McDonald has gone to serve as CEO of, at three different corporations. At present, Mr. McDonald is the CEO of PolySign, where he works to build enterprise-grade infrastructure for digital assets. Great. Uh, th thank you very much, Caleb. And uh, thank you very much to everybody for, for joining, uh, especially our, our panelists. Uh, so my name is Chris Materi, and I'm a first year MBA student. Uh, prior to starting school, I was working at CME Group, where I helped with the launch of the first Bitcoin futures and option contract, which sparked my interest in the digital asset space. One of the main reasons I chose to attend Georgetown for my MBA was because of the school's commitment to new and exciting areas in fintech. I couldn't think of a better school to pursue my relatively unusual desired career path in digital assets. Uh, as Professor Rossi mentioned, last semester I had the opportunity to write a white paper for the Center for Financial Markets and Policy on the institutionalization of digital assets. As part of the paper, I had the privilege of interviewing several senior executives at some of the largest firms involved in the digital asset space, many of which are taking the time out of their busy schedules to be with us here this afternoon. Uh, as previously mentioned, you know, prior to starting school, I was at CME Group, which was a company that played an integral role in helping institutions adopt digital assets. In my seat, I had the opportunity to see firsthand what institutional adoption of digital assets looks like, which prepared me quite well for writing this paper. However, when I started working on this paper back in September, the price of a single Bitcoin was only about $10,000. The entire digital asset market cap was about $300 billion. That's quite a far cry from the $55,000 price of Bitcoin and over $2 trillion market cap where we are today. In that time, we've seen countless institutions announce they began investing, trading, or looking into digital assets in some shape or form. Therefore, it's certainly safe to say that institutionalization of digital assets has ramped up quite a bit in the past six months since we, I started working on this paper. But that's okay, and that's why we love crypto so much, because it moves so fast. Uh, despite the changes in the crypto space since the time I started working on the paper, I would say my overall thesis and conclusions remain the same. 
In the paper, I concluded that the current status of digital assets is much more institutionalized than many think, but the space still has quite a ways to go. I came to this conclusion by analyzing companies like CME Group, Typhon Capital, Genesis, and PolySign to see the work they were currently doing in digital assets and what they had in their pipeline. For the paper, I looked at how current institutions on Wall Street began embracing crypto in addition to crypto native firms that helped that launch sophisticated products and offerings to help others adopt digital assets. To start off, I looked into the staggering growth in CME Group's Bitcoin futures contract as a leading indicator of institutional demand for crypto. With an advanced customer base of hedge funds, asset managers, banks, and professional market making firms, as indicators such as volumes, open interest, and long open interest holders kept increasing, it was a clear sign of more institutions trading and being interested in digital assets. Then I began looking at ways investors can get exposure to digital assets, which pointed me to Typhon Capital a global macro hedge fund that launched a crypto fund in late 2017 to meet investor demand. Speaking to James Katulis, I learned how managers such as himself are finding success employing risk mitigated strategies that are typically found in other asset classes into the crypto space. This then turned me to crypto native firms like Genesis, which are becoming full service prime brokers similar to what we're seeing in traditional markets. Mike Morrow's firm has done some amazing work mimicking a lending market to what we see in the security space. One indication of this is his, firm's, uh, is his firm originating a staggering $40 billion in loans since launching their lending business in March 2018. Additionally, with many traditional custodians such as Bank of New York Mellon and State Street acting slow to embrace digital asset custody solutions for their clients, firms like PolySign have begun to uh, offer custody solutions to their institutional investors. Custody in crypto is much more difficult than traditional products, and without a qualified custodian, which any institutional investor with over $150 million in assets must use, firms that wanted to invest in digital assets found themselves unable to. This opened the door to custodians like PolySign to act as a sub-custodian for larger banks. While all this may indicate that digital assets are becoming more institutionalized than many realize, there's still quite a lot of work to be done. In the back half of the paper, I discussed the need for ETF approval, improved regulations, more use cases for digital assets, and further education and market awareness. Ultimately, I was able to conclude that the current state of digital assets is much more institutionalized than people think, but we're still very much in the early days and a lot of work must still be done. Despite the dramatic growth in Bitcoin and the overall digital asset space over the past six months, I'm confident that these conclusions from this past fall still hold and likely will hold for the foreseeable future. One thing I'd like to leave everyone with is that just because the price of Bitcoin keeps increasing doesn't necessarily indicate institutionalization of digital assets in and of itself. There's still a lot of work that must be done, and we have the privilege of hearing from the experts this afternoon that are doing it. So I promise to keep my part of this today short, as I'm sure no one dialed into this just to hear me blabber on. So I uh, would love to uh, kick it off to some Q&A with our esteemed guests. So uh, if we could go around the horn a bit and ask uh, everybody if you could just spend a few minutes discussing your current firm your role there and how it impacts the institutionalization of digital assets. Uh, maybe we could start with Tim, then go to James, Mike, and Jack. So uh, thank you. Great, thanks, Chris. And, and thanks for organizing this. And thanks to everyone for joining us today. I'm looking forward to your questions and, and the conversation. So, so I, as Caleb introduced, my name is Tim McCourt. I am at CME Group. And our role in this place is we are a regulated marketplace, uh, specifically like a derivatives marketplace where we offer options on futures and futures contracts on the major investable asset classes. So things like equity index, foreign exchange, interest rates, metals, agricultural pro products, and energy. And my team looks after equity indices as well as alternatives, which we classify cryptocurrency as an alternative investment product at CME Group. And where we really kind of provide to the marketplace is we're a center of price discovery for the transfer of risk. Uh, the buyers and sellers meet on CME Group, they exchange the derivatives contract, and then that contract is essentially cleared, meaning that CME effectively guarantees the performance of that contract at expiration, and CME becomes the buyer to every seller and the seller to every buyer, such that there's no counterparty risk or direct counterparty risk uh, in our system. What that does is being a regulated exchange a regulated derivatives venue in the U.S. is we provide certainty 
as not only a regulated venue, but as an institution with 180 year history, we provide a lot of confidence in the marketplace for them in terms of risk managing cryptocurrency or accessing the cryptocurrency market because they're already managing a tremendous amount of, of other risk and other positions at the exchange. And I would say that's where our kind of um, nexus is in the cryptocurrency is offering that ability to provide regulated futures contract. And we're a very easy on-ramp for institutions because our financial, our futures contract is financially settled, meaning it's you settle the US dollar price performance against the movement of Bitcoin. We're not actually dealing with the transfer of the digital asset itself, which does make it, removes a lot of the barriers to entry when dealing with digital assets and onboarding. So we become, again, a very kind of easy on-ramp in a trusted, transparent, familiar way that also has all the benefits of being a U.S. regulated venue. Uh, and that's been, I think, a key secret to our success at CME Group thus far. Great. Thank you. James? Sure. So um, Typhon's been around since 2008. We're a multi-strat fund. We're set up so that all of our, our different portfolio managers are very modular. So customers could kind of pick and choose exactly what they want um, or come into a multi-strategy swap that we run or about to launch a multi-strategy private fund. Um, so crypto is set up in our own fund, the Lean IS Cryptocurrency Fund. It's won a couple major in industry awards. The PM, George Michalopoulos, was formerly the senior most energy derivatives trader um, at Citadel. So, uh, you know, the way we look at it is Python as a firm has done a very good job extracting returns from the very competitive commodity futures markets for, for 13 years. And, you know, George uh, uh, did a phenomenal job at Citadel, especially in 2008. So if you could take strategies that work in extremely volatile, extremely competitive commodity markets, they work even better in something like crypto um, which is it's really, especially Bitcoin, it is legally a commodity. It trades like a commodity, and uh, it's nowhere near as competitive um, as energy, for example, right? So uh, we were either the first or one of the first CFTC-regulated uh, crypto funds. Uh, we are a commodity pool operator, so, you know, we're very sensitive to the regulatory implications here. So um, Obviously, we're a big user of CME futures contracts. I think we started trading them within 30 minutes of them launching. Um, and I'm not paid to say that. We just actually use CME futures and like them. Um, and we do trade digital assets as well. So when you talk about institutionalization, uh, we're actually in the process of onboarding a $30 billion ERISA fiduciary uh, who will have exposure uh, to our crypto fund. Um, and so we're actually doing... Uh, diligence on crypto custodians right now. So, uh, you know, Polly, we haven't talked to you guys yet, but uh, hit me up. Uh, we should get you, uh, you know, in the mix because um, we are, at, you know, have an immediate need to um, add a qualified custodian there. Um, but anyway, look, crypto is growing rapidly. It's growing retail. It's growing. Um, hold on one sec. George has sent me about 300 messages in the last five seconds. Let me just uh, shut him up. Uh, <laughs> uh, wow, dude, settle down. Um, but anyway, listen, like crypto, the price action, all of that, very exciting. Um, things like SOC 2 and quality, qualified custody, probably not as exciting to talk about, but they are important to the institutionalization. So, you know, when you talk about ERISA fiduciaries, you know, they allocate to your crypto fund and there's a hack or something, like they could get sued. And, you know, let's face it, like the crypto space is still evolving. There have been a lot of hacks. Um, there are a lot of, um, you know, kind of bad actors in the space. So, you know, as, well, as long as crypto itself is built on decentralized, trustless authentication. Um, but, you know, where, where you see this kind of volatility, this kind of promise, this kind of like pi pioneering spirit in a contract, um, you still have to be really careful, right? So I think... Uh, taking the time to focus on these accounting, these technical custody things, you know, using people like CME to take the counterparty risk um, out uh, of the trade is, is kind of a great bridge into to, uh, full-fledged full digital assets and also to help hedge your, your digital assets position. So um, before I stop talking, I'll just say like, you know, we've, um, 
pretty strongly outperformed Bitcoin on a risk adjusted basis for our 51 month track record. We're at like a 6.2 Sortina ratio. Um, but our edge has actually doubled since the launch of the uh, options on Bitcoin futures, because that allows us to implement, um, you know, really sophisticated, um, you know, hedging strategies that, you know, we're used to doing in the commodities markets. And you couldn't do that a year ago without going OTC and taking on even more counterparty risk. So um, thanks, CME, for, for getting that done. Great. Great. Thank you, James. Uh, Mike? Hi, everybody. Uh, Michael Morrow. I am the CEO of, of Genesis, um, and we are a crypto-focused um, prime broker, um, helping institutions um, buy and sell uh, mostly sort of large block of, of, of various cryptos. Uh, we have a lending and, and borrowing business, uh, which, which Chris referred to in, in his paper. Um, we also acquired a custody business um, in May of last year out of, out of London. Um, and I'm thrilled to, to be doing this. Um, as, uh, as, as Caleb mentioned in the intro, I'm a, I'm a graduate of, of the undergrad business school. And my connection to the university has been embarrassingly light um, post-graduation. So I'm thrilled to have the opportunity to, uh, to, to chat with you. Um, you know, as far as kind of the role that Genesis fills within kind of the ecosystem, we, start, we launched our Bitcoin trading desk in 2013. Um, when the price of Bitcoin was called $80, $90, something like that. Um, and we chose to do it um, through our FINRA and SEC registered broker dealer. Um, so even though you know, Bitcoin was, is, is not a security, we chose to use a, a broker dealer to do it, mostly to um, bring about a little bit of professionalism, um, regulated, trusted, you know, counterparty um, to kind of the, the, the wild west that Bitcoin really was in early 2013, where, you know, uh, there was Mt. Gox and Bitstamp were really like the only two exchanges that were around. And, you know, Bitstamp was in Slovenia, Mt. Gox was in Tokyo. And every single time you wanted to fund it, you're literally hitting send on the website to fund the funds and you're keeping your fingers crossed, right, that the money gets there. Um, we really felt it was important for, for the, the earliest, earliest institutional investors to feel like there was a U.S.-based um, regulated counterparty for, for, for trading Bitcoin. Um, and it's frankly all we did for the first five years of our business until we launched our lending and, and borrowing business, mostly because um, spot borrow and crypto, which seems more commonplace today, didn't exist at the time. Um, and so we had lots of counterparties on our trading side come to us and say, can we get a borrow on Bitcoin or, or can we borrow dollars against our crypto holdings? Um, and at the same time, we had a lot of people come to us and said, hey, I'm long a bunch of Bitcoin because I bought it through you guys, um, but it doesn't yield anything. There's no interest. There's no dividends. It just kind of like sits there. Um, is there an opportunity for us to certainly kind of take some risk, but, you know, to, to earn some interest um, via a loan to, to Genesis? And so we really created sort of a two side, you know, two sided principal market uh, where we match, you know, uh, with, with Genesis with as, as the principal counterparty um, lending dollars or coins to Genesis and earning an interest um, on that. And then we turn around, do the credit underwriting work and then, and then lend that out to trading firms. Um, hedge funds um, and various sort of institutional players, um, either as a hedge working capital reason to go levered uh, position long or short. Um, and as Chris mentioned, um, you know, we're now up to about, you know, 40 billion of originations. 20 billion was done in the last quarter. So 50% of everything we've ever lent was done in Q1 of 2021. Um, and we ended March 31 with about $9 billion of, of loans outstanding. And we are the largest um, lending firm um, from a kind of from a capital provider to the crypto ecosystem um, today. Headquartered in New York, um, but we have offices in London and in Singapore. Um, and uh, we really have a sort of an international client mix to, um, to who ultimately who is trading with us. Great, thank you very much, Mike. Uh, and finally, Jack. Thank you, um, everybody. And Chris, uh, great job putting this together. It's just an observation before I introduce Paulina that, uh, or PolySign that we've got, I think, a lot of regulated entities here. And I think one of the things that we've talked about um, through the course of our dialogue with, with Chris is how 
the whole institutional adoption of digital assets is being fueled by more and more institutional grade infrastructure and regulatory clarity. And I think you're seeing that in the, in the remarks by the other panelists. I'm Jack McDonald, the CEO of PolySign. I joined uh, about three years ago after selling a company I was running uh, to a public company and that, that was in the traditional finance um, space. We had a prime broker and a uh, fund administration business. And so I had seen kind of the slow uh, emergence of, of cryptocurrencies and had a thesis that there would be this slow evolution and intersection between the traditional capital markets and everything that digital asset marketplace um, had to um, had to bring. And that's certainly borne out in my experience over the last three years. Um, I met a fellow by the name of Arthur Brito, who was one of the three co-founders of Ripple, who had left Ripple and wanted to start a company focused on helping digital assets realize their full potential by being securely held, freely traded and instantly settled. And he's a real blockchain uh, expert and wanted to build an infra infrastructure company leveraging uh, his blockchain expertise. And so that's what we've done. We have a couple of products that were uh, in the process of rolling out. Uh, our first product around custody uh, will be announced on Tuesday of next week. It's a New York regulated trust company uh, called Standard Custody and Trust that uh, provides essentially custody and escrow services to the 10 largest cryptocurrencies uh, by market cap. And then we have an asset betting policy. So any asset that meets our criteria, we can service. Uh, we're also uh, building a separate uh, blockchain enabled product called Polynet, which is focusing on a broader uh, transfer of wealth. And we're really focused there on bringing about instant atomic settlement uh, between different counterparties who want to trade a very broad range of assets. They could be digitized or non-digitized. Uh, and we think there's just massive opportunities to um, help bring greater efficiency to both the buy and the sell side. I think one of the things that differentiates us in the custody space is that we're the only custodian out there with a native blockchain to its core. And we do that to uh, add another layer of security uh, to our, our offering. There's also a lot of benefits from a regulatory compliance standpoint uh, because of the immutable nature um, of what a blockchain provides and we're able to store every um, aspect of an asset transfer uh, onto the ledger. And so we've gotten very good feedback from the regulators, from, from the market on that, and, and very excited to be launching that business. Great, thank, thank you, Jack. And uh, thank, thank you everybody for such great explanations. You know, one thing I just want to echo is we have four you know, like, amazing panelists across you know, all four different corners in, in the ecosystem, an exchange, asset management, prime brokerage, custody. So yeah, really, uh, you know, really, really great today. So th thank, thank you very much for, for explaining that, uh, everybody. So uh, in, in terms of the next question, I'd like to ask everybody, uh, what do you think is currently missing in uh, the digital asset space that, that is preventing institutions from, from entering these markets? Uh, if you could all maybe perhaps go around starting again with Tim uh, to describe maybe one or two things that you think, think is currently lacking the space and, and perhaps what your firm is, is able to, to do to, to help. I think you're on mute, Tim. There we go. Sorry about that. So yeah, so I think in terms of what's missing from the ecosystem, I think there are kind of two things, right? I think one, and certainly, you know, curious to hear kind of Mike's uh, comments, and I think it's more expansion of the prime brokerage-like services, right? Uh, that type of traditional finance application and tools, I think, will, is really needed uh, in terms of increased adoption to kind of get the institutional community to the next level uh, in terms of just making it plug and play with the way they've been operating. So, so I kind of maybe we'll leave some of that comments to Mike. But I think, I think from my perspective, I think what we really need is, and, and this is something that was addressed in the paper, is greater regulatory certainty about what are these assets that are being, that are being created. Uh, from our perspective, you know, as I mentioned, CME is a heavily regulated uh, exchange. Uh, we're also our own SRO, self-regulatory organization with our own regulatory obligations. So when we look to bring products to market, we need that regulatory clarity. So with Bitcoin, you have the CFTC in 2015 issuing what's commonly referred to as the Bitcoin letter, saying that Bitcoin is a commodity 
Uh, they did kind of stop just short of saying it's their exclusive jurisdiction, but it was enough, right, to kind of get everybody over the line that it wasn't a security, it's a commodity, and we could bring futures under the, the Commodities Exchange Act. Same thing with Ether, you know, where we have Ether futures at CME, not in the same um, formal way, but still in a very significant way. Both the CFTC and the SEC have said that Ether uh, is a commodity, not a security. So, again, that gave us the certainty, uh, a legal path forward to bring products to market. But of all the other tokens, even the top 10, it's still not certain what framework will apply if you try to introduce products. Um, so I think that would be the one thing I would really like to see is just some sort of framework that allows for a quicker determination of what some of the assets are. This way, if new assets come online, uh, it's just easier for those of us in the ecosystem to do what we do without having to wait for some of the clarity. Uh, because I think, especially in the regulated space, uh, we can be patient for success, we can be patient for adoption, and we don't want to kind of commit any fatal flaw. So without that certainty, sometimes it's a bit challenged to see the exact path forward. Uh, so I would say I think those are the two most critical things from my perspective and the exchange pers perspective with respect to removing further barriers for institutional adoption. Great, thank you. Uh, James, your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, institutions are investing, right? I mean, they're, they're at the point where they're dipping their toes in. You're talking like, a, you know, quarter of a percent of AUM, half a percent of AUM, stuff like that. But um, I mean, they're writing tickets. I mean, we, like when we announced the crypto fund in 2017, we got more calls, diligence requests than uh, I've ever had in my entire life, like combined, like in a week, right? I mean, like... Um, so look, I mean, I know like major endowments and foundations that have invested in rent tickets, pension funds that have invested in rent tickets. Um, you know, we've got an ERISA consultant coming in for July 1. We're in talks with two multi-trillion dollar investors, like one's like 900 billion, like a 50 billion, 25 billion. I mean, um, so I mean, look, they're, they're actively doing work in the space and, uh, you know, getting comfortable and, you know, things like custody, um, you know, they, they help a lot. I mean, and let's be clear, like even like maybe 18 months ago, you couldn't even get a monthly statement from like a digital platform, right? So like to go from that to now having like prime brokerage solutions and there's, you know, a bunch of firms have stock two certifications, like there's custody, custodians, sub custodians, like none of this stuff even existed like 18 months ago. So, I mean, the infrastructure, has been rapidly improving to meet um, those, those kinds of unsexy but important like regulatory and accounting needs for, for institutional investors. Great, thank um, you. Yeah, from, from my perspective, look, I think crypto is, is, is um, the way kind of the market infrastructure has developed where you have, I don't even know, you know, 20, 30, 40, call it meaningful exchanges. Um, liquidity is sort of scattered amongst the venues around the world. Um, and, um, you know, sort of always knowing, you know, the, the best price, the, the best, you know, bid offer is, is hard for, for a lot of different participants in the marketplace. And so, um, you know, what, what Tim was kind of referring to as far as like improvements on the prime broker side, that I think there's a ton to still do around cross-margining uh, of assets and, and really kind of giving, um, you know, uh, you, you fund, you know, one account, um, which kind of gives you, you know, access to liquidity from the 20, 30, 40 different venues without having to worry about funding each of them separately and kind of maintaining working capital in each one. Um, that's something obviously that we're working on. Um, and uh, as a, certainly a, 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 a liquidity tool to be able to provide, you know, our, our trading firm clients and our hedge fund, hedge fund, you know, hedge fund clients that are obviously doing, you know, millions and millions of dollars in kind of transactions every day. And ultimately, you know, um, we we spoke earlier about institutions kind of entering the space all the time. I feel like, you know, a bank is, is, is making a new statement or a new product announcement, service announcement, crypto all the time. Uh, but, you know, in talking to the banks, I think there's definitely an interest in kind of figuring out whether an interdealer market can like develop within the crypto um, ecosystem. Um, and, you know, because I think they're to themselves are trying to figure out um, this whole like, you know, settlement layer, um, how the, the, all of the, the, the market infrastructure that is developed without them, how do they fit into that? 
Uh, we don't have a, a DTC clearinghouse. We don't have a like a DVP type settlement that you have in other markets. And this idea in crypto, LTC land of, you know, one side of the trade has to move first. Um, the crypto move first or cash move first. And kind of taking that settlement risk with the counterparty is just something that is just not you know, normal to the banks. And so I think there'll be thoughts around creating a, uh, an exchange of sorts like an interdealer market, as well as perhaps a separately funded capitalized owned clearinghouse um, amongst kind of the biggest dealers in, 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 the, in, in the space. Interesting. Thank you. Uh, Jack, your thoughts? I don't have a ton to add because I, I, I think I mentioned this to you, Chris, when we were first talking. I think there's three components that are impediments to institutional adoption. One of them, Tim mentioned around regulatory clarity. Uh, the second that uh, James and, and Michael touched on around institutional grade infrastructure. I think both of those are advancing. We need more of both, but, but they're getting there. And the third is around education. I think when you still go to the boards and the, um, you know, the investment committees of large pension plans, endowments, you know, mutual fund companies, uh, there's still, I think, a struggle around getting comfortable with this new, I'll call it an asset class around cryptocurrencies, but it is happening. And I think, I think by having more regulatory clarity and infrastructure and big name organizations on the sell side coming in, I think that will help to fuel demand and gain, gain comfort. The only other thing I would add is, and I think it's an important um, evolution of thinking is we've been spending most of the time talking uh, about crypto but we are having conversations frequently with the institutional investors about a broadening of their thinking beyond just crypto. I think there's been an adage in the industry for a while that blockchain, yes, crypto, no, or crypto, maybe. But the whole use of blockchain technology, I think, is, is getting to be fairly non-controversial in terms of the benefits it can have in all sorts of different industries, but certainly financial services. And I think there's a growing sense that uh, there are other types of traditional assets that will benefit from tokenization over time and that will benefit from the use of, of blockchain technology. And so it may not be a cryptocurrency, but it may be a tokenized interest in a real estate building or a tokenized or fractionalized interest in a VC fund that trades more like a token on an exchange. And the free exchange of fiat for an interest in a VC fund or a crypto for a real estate uh, asset, uh, I happen to think, and as part of our thesis in terms of what we're building, that that is in the future. And we are getting some some lean in from broader institutions who are starting to think about how um, how their businesses are going to evolve. Uh, just very briefly, we're doing a POC with a very large asset manager in Europe right now who has built their business, as many large institutional investors have, through funding from pensions and endowments that have been operating from a surplus who are really shifting towards investing from a deficit. And the management at this asset manager is thinking about how they will create more products that are attractive to retail investors. And so we're actually helping them create a digital feeder into a institutional open-ended real estate fund. And that digital feeder will trade on an exchange and it lowers the investment bar for uh, retail investors. It also adds liquidity to the equation uh, that otherwise would keep a broader set of, of investors outside of those types of asset classes. So I think I think the conversation can likely, and we will all see it emerging beyond just uh, cryptocurrencies going forward. And I think that the term digital assets in many ways is more telling. Interesting, thank, thank you for explaining that. Um, so shifting gears maybe a little bit, uh, maybe a little, a little more lighthearted uh, question for, for everybody. Uh, what, what, what is, the, I would say, the funniest story that you had uh, that made you say to yourself, wow, we're really kind of in the early days here of crypto and uh, got, got you thinking uh, about that. Maybe you had a, a bit of a laugh about that you might want to share. Uh, uh, Tim? Yeah, I think it's a good question. Um, you know, I think there there's, I think kind of, I don't know if it's the, the funniest story, but I think one of the things that made me kind of think about it was when, Back in 2017, CME announced the launch of Bitcoin Futures on, on Halloween, right? And we were launching in December. And those kind of six weeks, uh, it was intense. It was, a, it was a big sprint to get everything over the line. But I think the one thing that was I found I was not prepared for, I don't know necessarily if it's the most, most comical, but CME is, is a very large institution, right? And we're typically 
doing, you know, working with large institutions. We have some retail clients, but they're typically on the higher end in terms of the active individual trader. And there was so much Bitcoin mania going on that we were literally inundated with phone calls of individuals who are literally calling every, myself and everyone on our team, like, I have a thousand dollars. How do I buy Bitcoin? And we were like, oh boy, this is not what we do. Right. So just trying to kind of educate the market of where CME fits in. I think that was kind of a grounding moment. It was certainly exciting that we were onto something, but we were overwhelmed with so much interest that we didn't cater to that I think we had miscalculated exactly how much of cryptomania was going on, where we, we wanted to kind of cater to institutions, but we weren't ready for kind of the, the public level of interest and kind of some of the scrutiny we got around it. So I think that was something that was surprising and certainly more like, all right, let's, let's buckle up. It's about to get interesting, you know? Yeah, very, very true. I remember being there during, during those times. Uh, James, your, your thoughts. Yeah, I mean, I, I see my share of frenzy too, right? Like um, I was working on a kind of VC project uh, what, like four years ago during kind of the mania where um, it was an algorithmic stable coin and, you know, wound up raising, it was like 133 million and a billion dollar implied valuation. And, um, you know, basically the company hadn't written a line of code yet. Um, you know, a great white paper and, you know, it was really one of the hot, um, you know, projects out there. And there was so much inundation of like investor demand that, uh, my buddies, like, you know, get emails from some of the most major VCs in the world, not even email them back. And then they just would start calling, right? Like, I mean, just begging to like, you know, get, get in this deal. Um, but yeah, it was so busy. Like the founders were actually taking turns, um, sleeping in their WeWork office with like eye masks and stuff. Like a lot of these, you know, they'd go like three or four days without going home. I mean, um, I've, I've never seen such, you know, in, in, in insanity. Yeah, I can imagine. Uh, Mike, I'm sure you're gonna have a good story as you were involved in Bitcoin back when it was $90. Yeah, the, I think the, uh, plenty of, plenty of frightening stories to kind of share. Um, I'll, I'll share something of, of that ilk, um, so when we first started in, in, in Bitcoin, the space was full of anarchists, libertarians, like government is bad, banks are bad, financial intermediaries are bad, regulation is bad, right? And, and obviously this, it's still, you know, it's still years after the financial crisis, but kind of the Occupy Wall Street narrative and like all of that was still remaining within the, 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 the clients that we were trying to kind of work with at the time. And we were like seen as like the suits, right? We were the, 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 the guys, it's like, we're the ones, we're trying to stay away from you guys. And, and, and so there was a lot of that, you know, and, but like we have people, individuals, not to the similar to Tim's story, but that would show up at our office. Um, and we had one guy show up with a suitcase in his hand, um, but like, and he had um, handcuffed to his wrist, a suitcase handcuffed to his wrist, come in, knock on our door and says, I want to buy some Bitcoin. Um, I heard you sell Bitcoin. I want to buy some from you. And like, it was like, and he's like, I'm not telling you who I am. You think you're going to get my driver's license, background checks. I'm not having any of it. I'm not giving you anything, but here's my proof of funds. And he opens up his suitcase. He's got a million dollars of cash in there. He's like, you can count the cash if you want, but I'm not telling you who I am. I just want to buy some Bitcoin and get out of here, right? Uh, I was like, sure, that's not how this works, like, at all. Um, and then we had to, like, escort the gentleman out of our office and, you know, all, all of that stuff. But that was like a, whoa, like, what did we get ourselves into here kind of moment um, from, you know, within the first kind of three or four months of us, like, trading Bitcoin. Oh, that's amazing. <laughs> I love that story. Jack, uh, it might be tough to top that, but any anything uh, on your I, I can't top it, but in a similar way, right when I started with PolySign, it was in uh, the spring of uh, 2018, and it was uh, the consensus conference in New York. Some of you guys may have been at it. And uh, I showed up in my sport coat. I don't think I had a tie on, but was blown away. It was at the, I think it was on the, the Hilton on uh, 6th Avenue. And they had run out of like, the, there wasn't enough food, the bathrooms couldn't be stocked. 
there were guys walking around in wizard robes. It's when all the Lamborghinis parked in the front and like stopped traffic. And I, it just dawned on me, I'm in a completely different world. And I will say that um, I also have been accused of being one of the suits. And that's kind of the approach that we take. And um, it's been interesting to see how that's evolved even over the last three years uh, that it is getting, I don't want to call it, it's far from mainstream. But I do think that as this institutionalization has happened, you are seeing more people from traditional finance come over. But I'll never forget, that was my first exposure really to this, this uh, industry and it was, it was pretty mind blowing. Yeah, we used, to, we used to do those conferences as well. They were uh, yeah, quite, quite an experience. Um, I guess last question for the, for the general audience before we get into some specific ones uh, for, for the panelists with uh, the time we have left. Uh, so we have quite a few uh, students on, on the line that'll be watching a recording for this. Uh, what, what sort of advice would you give to, uh, to, to you know, people like my age, I guess, interested in getting into careers in the, in the digital asset space or are potentially on the fence for it? Uh, any sort of advice starting with, with Tim? Yeah, I think it's a really great question. I think especially a lot of you in attendance who have made the move and have gone back to, to graduate school pursuing advanced degrees. I think there's a few kind of bits of advice that, that I would normally think about, but it really comes down to figuring out what motivates you, right? I think cryptocurrency and digital assets is certainly on the frontier. Uh, lots of innovation, lots of excitement, but there's lots, even on this call, there's lots of facets of the cryptocurrency industry that have really developed. So I think about just kind of figure out what's going to motivate you. What are you genuinely interested in and try to kind of marry that interest with specifically the digital asset or the cryptocurrency industry, if that's what you want. And what I mean by that is if you're really involved in technology, maybe look at some of the firms that are focusing on the, the building of networks or the building of applications. If you're really kind of more like myself, like a traditional market purist, if I have two decades of, of institutional equity experience when I'm so fascinated by crypto, there are places that you can kind of marry some of those interests of price discovery, regulated markets, trading, and then just cryptocurrency is the product of the vehicle or the medium. So figure out which facet you're attracted to and just know that it's not necessarily you need to go all crypto native, right? If that's what you want to do, excellent, do it. But if you kind of want a little bit of a hybrid or look at some of the institutions or traditional institutions that are doing it, I mean, the spectrum is huge. And I would just wouldn't, load, wouldn't, wouldn't limit yourself, figure out exactly what motivates you in specific other than just the umbrella term of cryptocurrency. And I think that would really help you narrow down your focus and make your networking more efficient about how to try and suss out those opportunities. Great, thank you. Uh, James? Um, you know, I mean, look, I, I like the crypto, crypto space, but you know, you gotta have the right kind of temperament for it, right? There's a lot of volatility. You know, you have a frenzy in 2017, you got a frenzy going kind of like December to February and, you know, like dog, I call it doggy coin, by the way, there's a dog on it. I'm not calling it dog, uh, doge coin, doggy coin to me. Right. But I mean, you know, some guy is worth 14 billion because of the coin that was a joke. Right. So, I mean, look, that's going to attract a lot of attention, but, uh, um, you know, there's Bitcoin's had seven drawdowns of 70% or more. Um, and you know, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's difficult for, you know, psychologically to kind of go through, um, you know, those swings, you know, for a lot of people. So, um, you know, you gotta, you, you gotta have kind of the right mindset to say like, I want my life to be at least somewhat tethered to a very kind of, you know, boom bust emerging, you know, field of, of, of uh, uh, you know, industry. And, like consensus shows, there's a lot of unusual uh, people in this space. I forgot my wizard robe today, though. Sorry about that. Oh, that's quite good. Mike? Um, so this is going to sound like a knock on, like, investment banking, and I don't mean it to be. Um, but when I was in undergrad and, and trying to figure out what I wanted to do, like, next for my career, like, you, back in the day, like, in 2000, 2001, you did banking or, like, consulting. Those were like the two paths that like everyone, you know, kind of chose. And I chose banking. I did city for, for seven, seven and a half years before I moved on to, you know, to, to do some of this stuff. And, and, you know, and I learned a lot, like 
you know, from a, uh, learning corporate finance and kind of getting the fundamentals of how Wall Street works. Like, there's no better training ground, I still think, than, than kind of the, the investment banking. Ground. However, I have been, you know, crypto trades 24-7, 365. So we need traders at like all hours of, of the day. And this is six months ago, seven months ago, we started, um, we have, we created a job rec for an overnight trader. Overnight trader, you work in the graveyard shift, like terrible, like over the weekend, a shift no one wants. And we posted this thing and we were getting resumes from like VPs, directors of like name a bank, right? They were applying to be an overnight trader on a weekend to trade Bitcoin. That is like one, how bad their current job was. And like two, how exciting they found this brand new asset class where like it's so early, um, businesses and, and pipes and, and, and roads and bridges, all the infrastructure stuff are still being built. And, and, and so, you know, for, for if you have no interest in crypto at all, by all means, you know, do not pursue crypto. If you want to do crypto, I recommend you do. If you're on the fence, and you do something else, like, I feel like that's a mistake. It's going to be nagging at you that you should have done it, that you had an interest in it, and you didn't do it. Because, frankly, most of your mind share is going to be on crypto anyway. Regardless of what job you do, you're going to be thinking about Bitcoin or Ethereum or kind of something in the back of your head. So yeah, um, if you're on the fence, you're, you should be in the yes category. Um, but to James's point, there's a lot of riffraff. There's a lot of noise figure out which of the companies and projects are like legitimate and real and, 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 and focus your, your, your efforts there. Um, because there's going to be a lot of companies that, you know, you join and it's just a complete joke and it's a waste of time and you could have had other career choices. Yeah. I like that advice, Mike. And I, I would say the same, if you're on the fence, you should do it because if it, if it's, it'll be a binary outcome, right? If you, if you decide that it's not for you or it doesn't work out, at least you will have had that experience. And I happen to think that the, opportunity is so massive and it's still very early uh, in this cycle that my strong suspicion is you won't regret it. But if you end up regretting it, you have learned a lot from it. And that, that makes it not being a mistake, uh, but it's an asset to learn from. I also agree with your advice, Mike, about trying to find the more established firms. There is a lot of, um, there are a lot of companies that will fail just by definition. It's a new industry. There's lots of startups. And if you can get lucky and be with a more established player, um, I would, by all means, uh, gear towards towards doing that, even if it means, you know, perhaps less comp or less equity. But I think your likelihood of success is higher. And just from a mindset, I think, you know, coming out of school, I think about your career in, in terms of stepping stones, right? Don't put too much pressure on yourself that this is going to be the final decision you make. It's all about gaining experience, meeting people. And, you know, I think about careers as tapestries uh, that come together, you know, over time. And you look back 20, 30, 50 years from now. And it will all somehow make sense. It's a mosaic, but um, your first your first roll out of school, uh, take the opportunity to go to where you think you're going to learn and meet interesting people. And I think this is a fa fascinating space to do that. Yeah, all, all great advice. Uh, I, I mean, I, I can personally even speak to that from my time at CME. You know, CME very large exchange, and I found myself you know wanting to work on the crypto projects more so than the 99% of other products CME had listed uh, on the exchange. So uh, very nice. I'm going to ask uh, one specific question for, for Mike and Jack before uh, opening up. I see that uh, there's a few questions in, in the chat. Um, so, so Jack and Mike, uh, as Georgetown alumni, um, please, please tell us like maybe one or two things that uh, for, from your experience at Georgetown as a, as a Hoya that's helped you know, contribute to your success and uh, prepared you for, for a career in, in, the, uh, crypto, in the crypto space. Uh, maybe starting with Mike. Sure. Um, so I was an international business major um, at, at, at Georgetown. And, and I think one of the, the things that, that you know, um, you don't remember much from your classes, your courses, but you really learn that like the world exists outside the U.S. Um, and, and, and in the ecosystem and in the industry of like crypto, where we have clients all over the world. You can buy Bitcoin, trade Bitcoin anywhere in the world. You have developers on Ethereum from you know, all the different countries of the world. I think you appreciate um, the, that you know, the life outside the US exists. Um, and we tend to kind of get trapped in sort of a, a, you know, a US mindset all the time. But we, I have a business 
where you know we have clients from all over the world and, and certainly um, appreciating different laws, regulations, cultures, customs, personalities of different people you kind of interact with. Um, and also, I'm also hiring into those offices around the world as well. So keeping kind of that global mindset, I think, is, is something that I definitely learned from, from my time at Georgetown that, um, that, that is proving to be you know, incredibly valuable even today. Once again, Mike um, stole my uh, stole my answer. I was in the School of Foreign Service and uh, also approached things with a very global mindset. The other thing I would add is that I think the Jesuits do a phenomenal job through the Socratic method of teaching to cause you to question and uh, to challenge different theses and, and to learn from it. And um, I think this is certainly a space that benefits from questioning uh, the, you know, the logic, the reasons why people are doing things, and just to have a very open-minded approach to it, but to always question in the interest of learning more. Uh, and, and that's certainly a skill I think that um, I picked up in college and in law school. That's been helpful to me. Great, thank you. Um, and I'm going to uh, now kind of uh, get to some of the questions in the chat that we've been seeing. If uh, anybody has any, any questions, uh, feel free to put, put them in the chat and we'll, uh, we'll try to get to them. Uh, the one uh, from Professor Rossi on NFTs. You know, what, what, is, what are your thoughts on NFTs and uh, their, their valuations? Uh, a hot topic now. Well, look, obviously by any traditional metric, the valuations are absurd. Um, we're in a really just bizarre situation now where 40% of all dollars ever created were all created in the last 12 months because of you know Corona and stimulus. So um, I think a big big part of all of crypto's rise has been just the su supply and demand um, dynamics where, you know, in the U.S. we've had, uh, what year is it? It's 2021 now. We've had, we're going on year 13 of quantitative easing now um, and have seen the, the most stimulus really ever um, in the last uh, you know, 12 months, and there might be two trillion or more, right? So, you know, if money's free and just being made up, then, uh, you know, why wouldn't you buy some doggy coin or buy, uh, you know, some tweet on NFT? I mean, it's, you know, it's all ludicrous, but, uh, you know, in a lot of, a lot of ways, like the, you know, the dollar has become almost like a joke that there's so, so many. And, uh, you know, honestly, I fear for the U.S. financial system if this behavior, um, you know, continues, like to have the world's reserve currency and just like, you know, printing like it's going out of style is, um, I don't think in the, in the best long-term interest of us as a nation, but, you know, as far as crypto is concerned, when you have this liquidity, you know, flashing around and you've got people at home bored, you know, for a, a year plus, uh, that's going to fuel asset bubbles. And yeah, by all conventional met metrics, uh, you know, NFTs and, you know, a lot of these joke coins, you know, are asset bubbles, but that, that doesn't mean they're going to pop. Uh, you know, tomorrow, as long as you see this excess of liquidity. Yeah, I think the interesting thing is, right, about NFTs is one, certainly kind of maybe one of the latest, uh, you know, uh, trends, fads, whatever you want to say, but like, personally, I'm much more of an efficient market hypothesis, right? You know, having kind of grown up in the trading arm, you know, for two decades plus now being at the exchange, it's like, the valuation has to be real by definition, because that is what somebody literally just paid for it. Right. So I think regardless of how crazy you might think it is, like the valuation is a market cleared transacted price, which is absolute in the price discovery process. So I think that's what's interesting is people are, you know, you know, um, James, to your point, like they can, they can be crazy by like other relative comparisons, but that's what it's worth. Right. And I think yeah. that is crazy um, that we're seeing this type of thing come out of nowhere almost. And now there's a whole market around NFTs and collectibles and people are hopping on the, you know, trying to figure out how to further monetize it. So I think even the valuation aside, the fact that people can transact something like that and create something that now collectively people are ascribing that value to, I think in of itself, taking aside the nuance of it being NFT, that's an astonishing development because it's hard to develop new markets, let alone things that people want to buy and sell in those markets. I'm just yeah, correct. Can, but, so so by way, one more cover bit, the cover bit might be 80% back, right? Like, so if you're a buy and hold investor, you're absolutely right. Like you, you pay for it. But if you have no expectation of flipping for a profit or like, or whatever, then by all means go nuts. Um, because I don't know how deep the secondary market is for, for some of this stuff. 
Sorry, James. Yeah, not at all. I, Tim, I was just going to say bubbles are actually rational, right? It's just, you know, you want to leave before they're over. I mean, I quote it all the time, but, you know, one of the best market quotes ever is Soros saying, if you see a bubble, buy it, right? And, you know, I've, I've talked to major, major institutional investors who say, uh, you know, that they wish that they could, you know, really just invest in traders who are trading blind, almost like the ender's game of trading and just like look at a chart and have people buy momentum because, you know, like look at what Tesla's done. I mean, like there's no way Tesla will ever generate earnings to grow into the valuation that they have. However, you know, buying Tesla um, and buying that momentum over time has been an incredibly profitable trade. Same as, as doggy coin. Doggy coin's a joke, right? It is a literal joke that, you know, your investment does not get you claim on anything else except, you know, the kind of the, the gambling as ability to tap into the greater fool theory and uh you know say if you could trade it and other people are going to get sucked into the momentum that you could sell later as, as, as a higher price and you know the rub with bubbles is you never know are they going to persist for 10 years or 10 minutes right so um i think that's what makes it you know fun uh you know for a lot of people but uh um look anybody who becomes a, like a doggy coin billionaire and you know books it like you know god bless right um can't you know, you can't be a hater, but uh, um, to think that the valuation is tied in any kind of like traditional, like fundamental sense, um, it's not. But, you know, you got trillions of dollars of free money and bored people. So uh, let's, yeah. you know, play the momentum. I know it's also like that old adage, right? Like the, the cure in commodities markets, particularly, it's like the cure for high prices is high prices, right? Because it will bring people in to sell. Um, so if you believe in that kind of balanced market hypothesis, um, you know, I think it, as long as the market is reasonably efficient, and I think that's maybe a big question in some of the, the non-top tokens and, and assets, then you'll, you'll, you'll maintain that equilibrium. And at some point, you'll see the, the supply and demand balance out in a market cleared price, right? Great. Thank you. Um, so I'm, I'm going to pick just in, in, in uh, respect of time. Uh, one question I, I, I saw from the chat. Um, what, what are uh, your thoughts as to what are the big drivers in the price of Bitcoin? Obviously, we went from, you know, as I mentioned, 10,000 back in September to 55,000 uh, up to 60,000 a week or so ago. Uh, like, and what, what, what are your thoughts as to what's driving the price of, of Bitcoin and other digital assets? Um, uh, so is that directed at everybody or? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we, Sorry. No, I was just saying, I think there's so much momentum, emotion, a lot of fear missing out. I mean, I'm, I'm, you know, when the Uber driver asks, or not, maybe not the Uber driver, but relatives of mine, you know, old aunts are calling and saying, don't you do something with Bitcoin? Should I buy it? You know, there's, people are watching the news. I mean, it's becoming mainstream on the news and people want to be a part of it. You know, it's, 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 it's market momentum. There are other reasons, obviously, you know, we've got smart people who consider it a perfect hedge to, uh, inflation, digital gold, but I think, you know, some of the recent volatility has definitely been, uh, I think, market driven around news. Yeah. And, you know, anytime you see a new announcement, right, like Tesla is putting on its balance sheet, like that's an S&P 500 company, right? Like, you know, like MicroStrategy, you know, every time a major company is putting on their balance sheet or any time you have a you know, major, new, you know, announcement, like Bank of New York's in it, Fidelity's in it, like yada, 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 right? Every single one of those announcements makes it that much easier, um, you know, for the next big name to put it. Because, you know, in, in institutional investors, there's always safety in the herd, right? Like when you're the only one to do something and then that goes wrong, you get fired, right? But if everyone does it and, you know, there's a big pullback or whatever, like you don't get fired because you're, you know, you're kind of keeping up with the peers. So um, that's a big dynamic in all markets, kind of like, you know, the, the herd mentality and there's, you know, safety in the herd until, you know, there's a major pullback, but uh, um, a lot of investment decisions are just, you know, made on that. And, you know, honestly, we're seeing the same dynamic here, you know, in Miami. It's like every time a major hedge fund moves here, every time a VC company moves here, a new tech company opens an office here, it makes it that much easier um, for the next, uh, you know, person to, uh, you know, the next major company to, to, to come here, right? Like, and, you know, I was I noticed on Twitter last night, like Pomp, who is like, you know, the prototypical, you know, crypto bull evangelist is now the Miami evangelist too. So it's, uh, uh, it's interesting to see like the overlap of that dynamic during Miami Tech Week, which basically sprang out of nowhere like NFTs and 
has been a major, major thing going on this week here. Great, thank you. Uh, so, so I know it is three o'clock, and um, you know, just just in, in, in conscious of everybody's time, uh, really want to th thank you know Jack, Mike, Tim, and everybody, and James, of course, uh, and, and Professor Rossi, Caleb, and everybody for for uh, participating today and uh, giving us the, the opportunity to do this. Um, it's really a pleasure having having a chance to write the paper and you know getting a chance to get, to work with everybody. Um, and you know, hopefully, maybe next time we'll be able to do something like this on campus next fall. And uh, to thank, thank you, everybody, for, for dialing in and uh, enjoy the, the rest of your weekend. So th thank you.